Hi, I'm Nick, and this is Today in Philosophy of History for Monday, 29 January 2024. This episode is not a celebration of, a, of the birthday of a philosopher of history, but rather it is an addendum on my addendum to my episode about Eric Vergland. Before I get into that, I was reading a paper by Richard T. Van, in which he includes an edit, uh, a discussion of the editorial policy of the journal History and Theory that is relevant here. Quote, the great speculators Vico and Hegel and later Marx were, if treated critic analytically in. Toynbee was taken seriously, if critically, but Spengler and Vergelin were out, unquote. That is the first time I have seen Vergelin thrown in the same basket with Spengler and essentially relegated to untouchable status. I thought that was amusing. When I was preparing my Fergalin episode and reading several of his papers and sections of his books, I noticed a lot of echoes of Husserl, and I wanted to follow up on that. As it turns out, Husserl was a significant influence on Fergalin. So I got Eugene Webb's book, Eric Fergalin, Philosophy of History, which was reasonably priced. I could get my own copy. But the, the books of the volumes of the collected works of Fergalin are rather expensive. So number 29, that has this selected correspondence from 1924 to 1949 that I got by interlibrary loan. And it has a, an interesting letter in it that I will discuss. Verlin liked to trash talk other philosophers. He called Hegel a sorcerer. He called Marx a swindler. So we shouldn't be surprised that he would say similar things about Husserl, and he did. So here is from his uh, autobiographical Reflections, which is a surprisingly philosophically dense work. It's not just a um, an account of his life, but a, very much an account of his thought. Quote, I still remember the shock when I read this philosophy of history. I was horrified because I could not help recognizing the all too familiar type of phrase constructions in which had indulged the Enlightenment philosophes and after them Comte, Hegel, and Marx. It was one of the it was one more of the symbolisms created by apocalyptic Gnostic thinkers with the purpose of abolishing a past history of mankind and letting its true history begin with the re res respective author's own work. I had to recognize it as one of the violently restrictive visions of existence that, on the level of pragmatic action, surrounded me from all sides with its tale told by an idiot in the form of communism, national socialism, fascism, and the Second World War. Unquote. So he's putting Husserl there in some pretty unflattering uh, company, um, and that's not the first time that's been done. Uh, but anybody who maintains anything is going to get that treatment sooner or later. But the trash talk is significant. It tells us that Fergalin did not read other philosophers sympathetically. He reacted against what they wrote. And he did this with Husserl, too. Part of Vergelin's motivation for the theory of consciousness that he developed was that he had encountered you know, Husserl's theories of consciousness, which is pretty elaborate and stretches across most of his works. And he perceived the inadequacy of that theory of consciousness from, from his point of view. So he realized he had to come up with his own theory of consciousness because he was confronted by this, this other example that needed to be countered as he saw it. Because of Vergelin's trash talking of others, his close readings of other philosophers can be like a hallucinatory experience where Vergelin's channeling some other thinker, but it's always his voice and his terminology. So it, it's a strange experience from my perspective. I mentioned in my Vergelin episode that he's difficult to read. And 
part of this is because he uses a lot of Greek and Latin terms in his own terminology. Uh, by the way, the, the Eugene Webb book includes a glossary that's very helpful because of all the foreign phrases and the, own, the, the, the peculiar meanings he gives to his own terms. So it's very helpful to have that glossary and the book is, is helpful in that respect. But I'm not the only one who's noticed uh, his his uh, odd use of terminology. So I've in the in one of the appendices to the uh, collected work, volume twenty nine. Berglin has sent his manuscript for the history of political ideas to Macmillan, and they responded with a cordial letter. But they concluded a several page review from an unnamed reviewer, relatively thorough. And it includes, it starts off with a, an amusing passage here. Quote, the book is not badly or unclearly written, but there are many evidences of, of the fact that English is not the author's native language. There are, there are, these are mostly cases of non-idiomatic sentence structure and the use of words in unfamiliar senses. Many of these could be corrected by a competent editor. In some cases, however, correction would be more difficult and require of the editor a service more like that of a service more like that of a translator, since a problem would be to understand the author's use of words and to find more idiomatic rendering. Such revision would be difficult and possibly the author would not welcome it, unquote. I've certainly found that to be true in reading Vogelin. And as I mentioned, the glossary in Eugene Webb's book is, is very helpful in this respect. So one of these hallucinatory Vogelin rants is relevant particularly to the philosophy of history. And it's about, it's a long letter that Vogelin wrote to Alfred Schutz about Husserl's philosophy of history. Schutz himself knew Husserl quite well, had met him on many occasions. I don't know if he directly studied under Husserl, but certainly he was in Husserl's close in circle. And Schutz had taken as his mission, as it were, to apply Husserl's phenomenological method to sociology. Schutz also corresponded with the well-known uh, sociologist Talcott Parsons, and this correspondence has been made available um, in a book called The Theory of Social Action, The Correspondence of Alfred Schutz and Talcott Parsons, edited by Richard Grathoff. It's a fascinating read. Uh, it's one of those rare instances of correspondence that's been published in which there's a complete lack of meeting of the minds, which Parsons even mentions that they, they can't seem to have a meeting of the mind. Partly this is because Schutz very much insists on a phenomenological foundation for sociological concepts. And Parsons doesn't want any part of it, basically. Uh, he's almost dismissive of, of Schutz's point of view. And it was interesting for me to find out that Vergelin also corresponded with uh, Parsons, as there are several um, letters to Parsons in this volume of, of correspondence. I didn't know that there was that level of interchange between uh, well-known sociologists and well-known phenomenologists of the first half of the 20th century, but apparently there was. Vergelin's correspondence with Schutz went on for many, many years. And in fact, it's all been published in its own volume. A Friendship That Lasted a Lifetime, the correspondence between Alfred Schutz and Eric Vergelin. So all this is, is available if a person wants to get into it. But I'm going to focus on the 16 page later letter that Schutz wrote to, uh, excuse me, letter to Schutz by Vergelin. Uh, started on the 17th of September, finished on the 6th, 20th September, September. So he spent three or four days writing this detailed critique of Husserl's philosophy of history. Before I start getting into that, I want to mention something about Husserl himself, if you're unfamiliar with that. Husserl, Schutz, and Vergelin all came from a Germanophone philosophical milieu. Husserl, who I might mention was a contemporary of Spengler, 
who was born after Husserl and died before him. So they were alive at the same time, but Spengler for a significantly shorter period of time. Husserl started in mathematics and later branched out into philosophy. Most of his philosophical career was spent elucidating mathematics, logic, and epistemology. Now, that way of phrasing it is a normie take on Husserl's contribution. Husserl's real contribution was his innovation of what he called the phenomenological method, which has been enormously influential, especially in continental philosophy. I would say that the only two bigger influences in contemporary continental European philosopher philosophy other than Husserl were Marx and Freud, which gives you uh, an idea of, of Husserl's influence and also explains some of the, the strangeness of continental European philosophy from an Anglo-American perspective. You get bizarre hybrids like Marxism with a pinch of psychodynamic psychology and a side of phenomenology. But all that came later and it doesn't describe Husserl's thought. Husserl, Husserl was a thoroughgoing rationalist. You could even call him uh, the arch rationalist of his time. And Vogelin's priorities lay elsewhere. That doesn't mean that Vogelin was an irrationalist. He wasn't, but his scale of values was clearly different. Vogelin's interest is in symbols, myth, divinity, transcendence. Of the two philosophers, Vogelin clearly has the greater historical erudition. He was very well read. He knew the literature and he had spent his life working on political and social ideas. Whereas Husserl had spent his life elaborating phenomenology and he only came to philosophy history late in his life. To give you a flavor of Husserl's attitude to history, I will read a section from one of the manuscripts that was published as an appendix to the Crisis of European Sciences, which is known as Husserl's great last work, left incomplete when he died, but published posthumously. This is from the appendix titled Philosophy as Mankind's Self-Reflection. A new quote, a new meaning is also given to human existence. Man's existence in the spatio-temporally spatio given, pre-given world as a self-objectification of transcendental subjectivity and as being, its constituting life, what follows is the ultimate self-understanding of man as being responsible for his own human being. His self-understanding as being in being called to a life of apodicticity, not only in abstractly practicing apodictic science in the usual sense, but as being mankind which realizes its whole concrete being in apodictic freedom by becoming apodictic mankind in the active life of its reason. Through which it is human. As I said, mankind understanding itself as rational, understanding that it is rational in seeking to be rational, that this signifies an infinity of living and striving toward reason. That reason is precisely that which man as man in his innermost being is aiming for, that which alone can satisfy him, make him blessed, that which allows for no differentiation into theoretical, practical, aesthetic, or whatever. That being human is teleological being and an ought to be, and that this teleology holds sway in each and every activity and project of an ego. And through self-understanding in all this, it can know the apodictic telos, and that this knowing, the ultimate self-understanding, has no other form than self-understanding according to a priori principles as self-understanding in the form of philosophy, unquote. As I said, Husserl was very much a rationalist and it's on display uh, in that passage, but also in the, on display in that passage is that Hurl, Husserl gives us a clear picture of his conception of how reason manifests itself in history, which is something I discussed in my episode on David Strauss. This is a problem or an issue that comes up in many philosophies of history, whether there is 
a manifestation of reason in history, or whether reason is history is just one damn thing after another. So Husserl very much falls on the side of the spectrum of the history that reason is manifesting itself through history, but through human effort. And Fergalin reacted against this, but not against all of it. He praised Husserl in, this is from the, on the first page of the, his letter of 17 September to, to Schutz. He says that uh, he, he manages, he got a, a copy of an early version of Husserl's last work uh, loaned to him. And he says, it lives in the Olympian atmosphere of the purest philosophical enthusiasm. The command of the material is masterly, and it is the most significant achievement of epistemological criticism in our time. So that's pretty glowing praise. And it reminds me of Bergelin's paper on Toynbee that also starts out with really glowing praise. You could even say it is immoderate praise. But then he goes on to, in the near the end of that paper, hammer Toynbee quite mercilessly as somebody who just doesn't get it because he's unwilling or unable to take the next step in his understanding of history. In the same way, after praising Husserl, Bergelin find a great many uh, shortcomings. So I'm going to quote a, a longer section from this letter. Quote, Husserl is a philosopher of progress in the best manner of the period in which the German empire was founded, a period for which Nietzsche had a few choice words. Every philosophy of progress based on the assumption of a developing telos must solve the weighty problem of relevance that already Kant found deeply troubling. Kant's metaphysics of history also encountered the problem of a reason that develops toward perfection in an infinite historical process. In his idea for a universal history from a cosmological point of view, he thoroughly examined the notion of such a development and then, at a decisive point, expressed the thought that such a development is disquieting because it seems to produce earlier human generations to steps over which the last perfect generation mounts in order to reach its goal. For under this assumption, is the, is the historical human being anything but the means to an end that only the last age of humanity can attain?" Unquote. And then a little further on, quote, Kant's favoring of the later generations does not emerge so crassly since on the assumption of the infinite process toward perfection, each, historical, each empirical historical generation shares the fate of imperfection with all others, unquote. Now this is a like I said this is a very long letter it's 16 pages in the edition I have uh, I'm going to read one more quote right from the from the end of it quote in place of the higher foundation in the experience of transcendence we find the foundation in the intramundane particularity of an epistemological problematic that originated by Descartes. I don't know whether Husserl was insensitive to experiences of transcendence, whether he drew back from them in fear, or whether there is a biographical matter involved. In order to ground his position, he took recourse to the imminence of a historical problematic and very carefully barred the way to the problems of philosophical transcendence, the decisive problems of philosophy. Therefore, we find the interpretations of history through the telos that is revealed in him, a position that found in a philosopher of stature can only be termed ob. Therefore, the justification of his position as a functionary of the telos and the inability to find the absolute point in the, philo in the philosophy of others because he could not find it in his own. Therefore, the apparent inhumanity and the degradation of his predecessors. And therefore, I would venture to say the character of his works as a continuing Prolegomena, unquote. So a couple comments on this, this last quote that I just read. The, the charge that Husserl's work was just all prolegomena, all introduction and no substance is a familiar one. And it's somewhat justified because of all of the books Husserl published in his lifetime, they were all titled an introduction in some way or another. But he was trying to formulate a new methodology, the methodology of phenomenology, so he had something he was trying to get across that was novel 
and each of his works did have a an introductory character to them. But Fergalon goes on to the next step and says he never really got beyond the introduction and he couldn't get beyond the introduction because he couldn't find the core problem. And as as he as Fergalon says in that last quote, uh, that it's really the problems of transcendence are the, are the core problems of philosophy and Husserl couldn't get to it. And once again, as with the essay on Toynbee, it's implied that he either won't or can't take the next step to to make it to that engagement with transcendence. Now that's interesting insofar as on the very first page of the letter, despite Berglin saying that Husserl stopped short of transcendence, he writes, quote, nor has the problem of transcendental subjectivity as the theme of philosophy since Descartes ever been made so clear to me as it has been here. The criticism of earlier attempts to formulate the transcendental question appears to me to be absolutely correct. Correspondingly, the analysis of the egological sphere and the grounding of the world's objectivity in the performance of the transcendental ego is completely successful, unquote. So once again, that's high praise, and he's acknowledging that Husserl's method is a transcendental method, but he still thinks, as he says in the end of the letter, that Husserl has fallen short of dealing with these core transcendental problems of philosophy. When, as he closed the letter to Schutz, he called it a cathartic exercise, and presumably he said that to signal to Schutz that he didn't really expect an answer to his long letter. But Schutz replied somewhat enthusiastically, and he got back with a long response of his own on the 11th of November, 1943. He assures Vergelin that I was never any knight squire. So, you know, if 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 Vergelin was worried that Schutz might be upset by his criticism of Husserl, um uh Schutz is assuring him that he was never that close of a follower of, of Husserl. I'm not going to go over this letter by Schutz in detail. It would be interesting to do so, but I just want to quote this one passage because I will come back to it again because it's quite relevant to what's going on in Vogelin's criticism of Husserl. Quote, I cannot find a single passage in the entire essay in which Husserl says that the phenomenology that he created is the final establishment of the movement of the entelechy. Such a statement would completely contradict Husserl's intellectual and humane attitude. Husserl merely says that with transcendental phenomenology, the revelation of reason, which is how he understands the course of philosophy, has reached its apodictic beginning and, as an infinite task, has achieved its horizon of apodictic continuation, unquote. I agree with this, and I will come back to it in a moment. So what is going on here? There, there's a lot of, um, I'm more familiar with Husserl's language, so I'm not phased by that. I am phased by a lot of Vogelin's um, language and concepts because I'm not so familiar with that. But both of these are you know, philosophers who have spent a lot of time on these problems and they have a very different point of view. They have and a very different conceptual framework that they're using and different analytical tools, you could say, that they're bringing to the table to try to get at this. So is it that Husserl just doesn't get it, like um, Vogelin implies that Toynbee doesn't, just doesn't get it, and Husserl can't make the breakthrough to the, the core transcendental problems of philosophy? Or is Vogelin lost in the weeds? So what I think is going on is that Husserl represents a thoroughly platonic position according to which knowledge is the good. And for Husserl, history is a teleological convergence on knowledge by philosophers and knowledge, once again, knowledge is the good. So we're having a teleological convergence on the good. And that is what is animating the historical process. And Husserl also insists that this is an infinitistic historical process. In many, many of Husserl's works, he, he places a great emphasis on that. 
So Virgulin design denies that it's, that it's an infinitistic process. And he says that Husserl is just a classic three stage philosopher of history where there's one stage from, from earliest prehistory up to the Greeks. And then there's this blossoming of Greek rationality. And then there's a period from the Greeks up until Husserl himself. And then Husserl, Husserl's establishment of phenomenology as an apodictic science of consciousness. That is the final establishment, which Virgilin called it several times. And Schutz replied, but no, it's not really a final establishment. So I think that um, part of Virgilin's response to Husserl is just simply wrong. And that's how Schutz uh, responded in part. But the idea that philosophy is about the development of reason is and 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 it is an uh, an endless process of trying to iterate this is very clear in in Husserl's works and there's a really interesting I couldn't find the quote just now while I was looking for stuff before recording this there's a very uh, wonderful quote in Husserl which he said when he says very late in his life that after trying all his life he's finally become a genuine beginner so he's not saying he's he is saying that he's achieved something with the in, with the establishment of phenomenology as an analytical tool of thought, as it were. Uh, but he's saying he's always a beginner, and you always have to go back and, and try, try again to try to get clear about these fundamental concepts. And truly enough, if if Virgilin misconstrued a finalized teleology in Husserl. Um, Husserl's extreme rationalism and history interpreted according to this rationalism gives us a little insight into how Virgilin was reading Husserl's philosophy of history. We will recall that Virgilin's, um, one of his most important and popular books was uh, Science, Politics, and Gnosticism. And he analyzed in that what he identifies as a modern form of Gnosticism lurking behind the catastrophic political developments of the 20th century. Now, many people have criticized Virgilin's use of the, of the term Gnosticism. And of course, Virgilin was aware of these criticisms and he push back on them. There's some interesting sections in his autobiographical reflections in which he explicitly mentioned criticism of his use of Gnosticism. And he says that that this wider use that he uses is, is quite, is, is more common than people realize. I recently learned that this uh, term has also made an appearance in the culture wars. James Lindsay has picked up on Virgil's uses of Gnosticism and is using it himself in, in a very similar way. When you get a term like that that's caught up in philosophical and even political controversies, obviously any narrow philosophical meaning is going to go out the window. But Gnosticism in its original usage just meant knowledge. It's the Greek word for knowledge. Now it came in the late antiquity, in the period of late antiquity, it came to mean you know, sometimes secret knowledge or hidden knowledge or some kind of special knowledge when we refer to the Gnostic religions of late antiquity, they were religions with elaborate initiatory rites. And when you were initiated into the cult, then you were given the secret special knowledge that made you a full initiate of that mystery religion. But in all cases, uh, Gnosis is about having some kind of knowledge. And on this knowledge, I found an interesting quote in the Eugene Webb's book. Quote, the claimant to the certainty of gnosis lives in constant fear that reality may give the lie to his claims. 
he may bury the consciousness of this fear so deeply that it virtually eclipsed for him, but there always remains a residue of anxiety that speaks to him for his, of his finitude and of the impossibility of transcending it, even if that speech falls on deaf ears and survives only in the mute forms of frustration, anger, torment, or despair, unquote. So, by Eugene Webb's account, I could be considered a Gnostic. Uh, I don't suffer from torment or despair, and I'm not about to sacrifice a bull to Mithras to shore up my Gnostic credentials. Uh, maybe I should. Maybe my life would be improved if I occasionally sacrificed a bull to Mithras, and I have to admit, I have not tried it. Uh, but given our modern conception of reason, which is has its ultimate origins in Plato and has been repeatedly revised most recently and most significantly by science, we always live in fear uh, that reality will give the lie to our claims. And if, if not, then our claims are unfalsifiable. And we recall that falsifiability was Karl Popper's influential criterion of scientificity. If a proposition can be falsified, then it's scientific. If it can't be falsified, then it's non-scientific and there's not much you can do with it Maybe it's an article of faith, but it's not part of science. And implicitly, then, it's not part of knowledge. Given Vergman's extra-rational scale of values, Husserl's teleological focus on rationality, almost to the exclusion of all other elements, probably seems pretty thin and threadbare. And I can easily understand why people would be attracted to Vergelin's elaborate effort to include other expressions of human activity like myth and, the, and, and transcendence, etc. This isn't the only thing that separates Vergelin and Husserl, and they did hold much in common, as different as the two were. Uh, they held in common a non-naturalistic conception of science, which places both of them well outside the mainstream of 20th century thought, and I had intended to talk about their conception of science in this episode, because a scientific conception of history that isn't really scientific at all in the conventional sense is a very interesting prospect for the philosophy of history, but I am going to save that for another time, so I thank you for listening. <laughs>